Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Brigham Young succeeded Joseph Smith to be president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In our next conversation with Denver Snuffer, he will tie the law of adoption to Brigham Young and how Brigham chose to justify his ascension to the presidency of the LDS Church. We'll also talk about the polygamy affidavits used to justify polygamy um, and why Denver thinks those affidavits shouldn't be used. Check out our conversation. But the idea of adoption had a profound effect on the history of the church because Brigham Young led the first company. They come in. This is the place. They settle down. He has himself uh, anointed a, a king and a priest in the log cabin that was built. And then the king returns across the plains back to uh, winter quarters. On his way back, he runs into the company that had John Taylor and um, Parley Pratt in it. Uh, John Taylor and Parley Pratt had some kind of sealing adoption organization put together for the companies they led in the migration. And when Brigham Young met them, they had reorganized the companies that they were in, contrary to the way that Brigham Young had adopted folks together in the ceremonies in Nauvoo. So now they were in defiance of the priesthood by what they'd done. Well, they were members of the Quorum of the Twelve. They were, I mean, the vote that was taken on, what, August 8th of 1844 was that the Quorum of the Twelve would take care of the church. Not Brigham Young. It was the quorum. So John Taylor and, uh, and Parley Pratt didn't regard Brigham Young as having any right to rule and reign or dictate uh, over them. They were doing what they thought best after they saw how the company functioned. They, they realigned the adoptions as they were going west. Well, Brigham Young fumed from there all the way back to winter quarters. And while we didn't have them before, the collected uh, complete discourses of Brigham Young, which I think were put in print for the first time in 2011. Uh, you, you can look. I mean, yeah, it, that's a really expensive set. Yeah, yeah, I bought one of those. <laughs> oh, you did? They were they were meant for libraries, but I bought one. They are wow, expensive. Yeah. But they're comprehensive. You can read what happened. There's there's a when Sidney Rigdon was campaigning to be elected after the death of Joseph Smith, his, his speechifying in Nauvoo to try and solicit votes for him was bizarre. I mean, he, he, his, he, he seems deranged. Brigham Young spent several days trying to persuade Wilford Woodruff that he, Brigham Young, needed to be elected president. They needed a president. And Woodruff wouldn't relent. His position was it required a revelation to reorganize the first presidency. And um, Brigham Young's position was it didn't require a revelation. It just required a vote. That Joseph Smith got made president by revelation or by a vote of the, the, the group. He did not get made president by a revelation. Common consent. Yeah, it was just an election. It was just, and that he could be elected the same way and it would have exactly the same effect. No revelation required. And eventually he wore down uh, Wilford Woodruff. Woodruff got on board with that. And they assembled, they called a general conference and they held a vote. Um, in the process of holding the vote, Brigham Young did some speechifying. And, and I tell you, it reminds me, it reminds me of Sidney Rigdon in the August campaign in Nauvoo for the election, he's practically incoherent. Now, to give him the benefit of the doubt, he'd kept Wilford Woodruff awake, haranguing him, and he couldn't sleep if he was doing that. So he's sleep deprived at the time he's giving the talk. But one of the things that he says in the aftermath of being elected is that he could hardly wait to get back to Salt Lake, to have Parley Pratt and John Taylor confess that they are not Brigham Young, meaning that now he's in authority, 
and he has and he alone has the right to dictate what goes on and that it is an act of apostasy against the priesthood to rebel against what the chief says because because they apparently were not willing to relent when they came across the plains so having been elected as president in winter quarters he goes back to salt lake and the rest of the quorum of the 12 who were back in salt lake have to choose between a fight again after relocating from nauvoo over leadership or submitting to what Brigham was saying, and rather than split things up again, they relented, Brigham was elected, and he says he has the right to dictate. Well, they, he still had not yet clarified that he intended to assert that he and he alone could seal, because Parley Pratt, even after that, sealed other women to him, including Lenore, whose husband would ultimately murder Parley, um, and um, Brigham Young would later say that those women that Parley Pratt sealed to himself after Brigham was elected president was adultery. And he went so far as to say that the murder of Parley Pratt was justified because it was adultery and he essentially had it coming to him. Um, because once he was elected president, uh, Brigham Young said, I and I alone am the only guy who gets to so be sealed. So he ceiling. consolidated the ceiling power because it was kind of distributed before that. It was, it was far and wide. All of that history needs to be taken and put into the hopper if you're trying to figure out what Joseph Smith was trying to do <laughs> with sealing between the Fanny Alger moment and the moment at which Joseph is slain. Because if he had absolutely no intention of creating sexual access to women by sealing, but he had instead the intention to put together in a form that would be recognized into eternity as a familial connection, as um, Bushman puts it, familial plentitude, then we really have to put on a whole different lens if we're going to try and interpret what went on. So I was grappling still in passing the heavenly gift with the whole subject. Uh, I, was, I was trying to show appropriate deference to whatever the historical narrative was. I mean, I wrote that book as a member of the church. Yeah. I, I didn't, I mean, I pulled every punch that I could pull uh, in order not to be someone that's just... Um, a hostile critic. I believe, I believe if the LDS Church had adopted passing the heavenly gift like they adopted rough stone rolling and they said, look, this is a very different way to look at the history of the restoration. But you can look at it this way. And if you do, you can still be you know, happy and associate with us. I believe if they had done that, they would be facing today far less of a religious crisis than they are currently facing with the members of the church. I never left Mormonism. I never even left the LDS church. The LDS church gave me the boot, but I mean... I was a 100% home teacher. I was a, a tithe payer. I was a temple recommend holder. You were on the high council, as I understand. I was, I was a top missionary prep, I think it was. I did. I taught gospel doctrine. Um, I was, while all this nonsense was going on, the flap about the book, I was helping at the request of the um, stake president uh, a returned missionary who had lost his testimony and was a student at BYU. And so uh, he said the only one he knew in the stake that could help the young man was me. And so I had him come over um, to my house. In fact, I would, I, would go to, I would go to interviews with the stake president preliminary to the issue of whether I'm going to be excommunicated or not. And on my way home from that, I would stop by and get this 
return missionary in a faith crisis, he'd come to my house and we'd spend time talking about what his issues were. The first issue and the most troubling to him was polygamy. So we started with polygamy and we spent weeks talking about that topic. Then the next topic, I forget what it was, but we didn't, he had a list of concerns. By the time we got through the first two, he said, really, I don't think I've got any other concerns because what you said satisfies me that I'm, I'm looking in the wrong place for answers. There's, okay. there's more substantive material out there that answers. Because in your book, you basically said, um, and this is really attractive to me, I'm going to tell you that. Yeah, yeah. That you separated the ceiling from the polygamy. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, with your new uh, version of, and I know you don't call it the Doctrine and Covenants. The remember. Teachings and Commandments. Teachings and Commandments. <laughs> yeah. Um, you kind of excised the polygamy parts out of 132, is that right? I tried to fix 132. I, I actually went through it and tried to make it a consistent document. I, okay. I said to myself, okay, knowing everything that I know about what went on in the Restoration, if I start with this document, can I fix it? And I made a concerted effort, the, the dramatically contradictory stuff, I threw out the contradictions, and I tried to edit it. You probably it. threw out the condemnation to Emma, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear that, because yeah. that bothers me. I tried, I tried to fix it, and, and when I got all done with that, I thought, well, maybe that is, is if, if they were interlineating. I mean, DNC 132 was hidden until... Um, 1853. A, yeah, when it was first announced in a, in a general conference talk by mm -hmm. Orson Pratt. Uh, until then, it was hidden. What do they do with it in the interim? Because the only copy that we've got is in the handwriting of Joseph Kingsbury. Yeah, well, Emma, Emma burned the one, right? Yeah, well, Emma was, was allowed to burn the one. She was, it was, everyone agreed to I it. Mean, so, well, going back to here, because... But, but, gonna... but think about what the source is. Joseph Kingsbury. Joseph Kingsbury. It's not... A clerk of Joseph Smith's in the historian's office. It's not a scribe of Joseph Smith. It's a guy. So you're saying it's a myth that Emma threw it in the fire? No, I'm saying that the copy we have, the only extant copy we have, is in the handwriting of Joseph Kingsbury. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was that existed before that, that he says he copied from what William Clayton wrote, and we've got. Kingsbury's word for it. Um, Kingsbury did not work as a scribe or someone that helped write history for Joseph Smith. When Kingsbury was called to testify in the Temple Lot case, he refused to swear to tell the truth about 132. Hmm. He, he would not swear that his testimony could be charged with perjury if it wasn't true. He just refused to take that so oath. So he did not testify? He testified. He, but said, he refused to take the he, he refused to take the oath, but he testified anyway. Oh. He said, I'll <laughs> affirm. I'll affirm, but I will not swear to it. And they want to know what the difference was. And he says, affirm is just me telling you what I understand. But if I swear to it, I can be charged with perjury. And he didn't want to do that. And they let him testify anyway? Let him testify in here. Oh, I've never heard of that before. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, but so so with passing the heavenly gift, you were under the... I was still under the, the effort to explore and try to understand. And so you believed that Joseph Smith did... Tried to make the church's story work. Th with polygamy? Yes. You tried believe Joseph practiced yeah, polygamy? Yeah, trying my best to make that story work. But you don't, you don't stand by that anymore? Well, I, f I finally reached a conclusion... Part of the reason I was able to reach a conclusion is the Joseph Smith papers coming out and source material that didn't exist then existing now and research that was done by a number of others that uh, has also rolled out. I mean, I thought at the time passing the heavenly gift was printed, I thought the evidence was really equivocal. It's clear. Well, Michael it's, Quinn it's, still thinks it's pretty clear, right? What's that? Michael Quinn still thinks it's Well, Michael clear. Quinn gives credence to the 1860 affidavits. I mean, he, he has a hard time envisioning the idea that a whole bunch of people would sign affidavits in 
Joseph F. Smith's affidavit book to right. support the lawsuit right. if they were swearing falsely. And those affidavits were used as evidence in the Temple Lot case. Right. So they were gathered with a specific purpose in mind. Well, think about it. Now, in the 1860s, they're, for the first time, creating a record about what had happened two decades or more earlier, and Joseph is dead, but they've made public and they have taught you. They've reassured you. They've testified to, from the pulpit to you since the 1852 time frame that this is a revelation that came through Joseph Smith. And you know your church is true. And you know that that, that temple in Kirtland belongs to your group. And you know, because he said it, you know Emma's apostate. Brigham Young called her a wicked, wicked, wicked woman. If Joseph Smith wants to be with Emma Smith, He's going to have to go to hell to be with her because that's where that wicked, wicked, wicked woman is. They know all that because they've been told that in isolation here for a couple of decades and Joseph's not around and you've got a burning testimony of the restoration. Uh, are you going to sign an affidavit when you know it's true? When you know, I mean, the church leaders are asking that you sign. A member of the Quorum of the Twelve a future president of the church, a member of the first presidency, is asking you to sign an affidavit. Are you going to sign the affidavit? An affidavit that makes you look like an unvirtuous woman? Like, who, who in their right mind would do that? It's not unvirtuous in the state of Deseret in 1860. But the entire government is trying in to fact, shut down the, the church over this. It doesn't matter. They won't succeed in doing that until 1890. In fact, it's those promiscuous Romans that introduced and enforced monogamy so they could get a supply of prostitutes. The virtuous, lovely Christian community, including, according to Brigham Young, Jesus Christ himself, they were all polygamous so that you didn't have to have prostitutes. But the wicked Mormons, or the wicked Romans, the Romans wanted monogamy because they needed an ample supply of prostitutes to keep themselves happy in their public baths and such. So the virtuous women were the polygamous wives that, that, that bore children and lived in a familial relationship, not those monogamous fools that, that pretend to piety and produce prostitutes. It's like um, Mark Twain commented in Roughing It, um, uh, he said uh, when, when uh, he first thought of plural wives, he thought it was an exercise in uh, a licentiousness. But when he got a look at the poor, ungainly creatures that were being married, he said he felt inclined to take his hat off in reverence because he's standing in the presence of pure Christian charity. The man that would marry one of them was a Christian soul. But the man that would marry ten of them <laughs> has committed an act of Christian charity and virtue that's unthinkable in the modern world. But that's Mark Twain, yeah. and he's always tongue-in-cheek. He's pretty funny. But i got to tell you, have you seen the picture of Sarah Pratt in volume 10 of the, of the Joseph Smith papers? I have not. It's worth the trouble. It's worth the trouble of looking at the picture of Sarah Pratt in volume 10 of the Joseph Smith papers. I, I have a friend, I went to law, <laughs> I'll leave his name out. I have a friend I went to law school with who's a descendant of the Pratts. His last name isn't Pratt. He's a descendant of the Pratts. Sarah Pratt. Looks like my law school buddy <laughs> with long hair. <laughs> Twain was right. It was an act of Christian charity. <laughs> Boy, now we're way off. All right, yeah. We're yeah. way off base. Yeah. And... Well, it's a little... <laughs> all right, so, um, and I, I, guess... I do know some Pratts. They're probably all going to be offended at this. 
<laughs> okay, you go, you go look at the photo and you decide for yourself. <laughs> okay. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Denver Snuffer. In our next conversation, we'll talk more about the remnant movement. Is it a church? The, uh, there the isn't remnant. a church. There isn't a church. Except a church. in the sense that the church was defined in the revelation given to Joseph Smith. The church that existed were people that repented, came into the Lord, and were baptized. That's it. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.